Cool. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us here today uh, for one of one part of Muhai's online lecture series on COVID-19. Um, joined here today with Professor Jane Gunn, who is a clinical general practitioner. She's also the inaugural chair of primary care research at the University of Melbourne, where she's also deputy dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentist Dentistry and Health Services. But also importantly for today, Jane is a leader in the clinical, clinical research on mental health in the primary care setting. So thank you for making the time to talk with us about COVID-19 and its implications on mental health and primary care reform today. My pleasure. Nice to be with you. Perfect. Thanks, Jane. So my first question is just really broad, um, but what is the research that you are currently doing on mental health? How did you first become interested in that research? Yeah, well, look, the research that I've been doing on mental health really focuses on mental health in the community, particularly how people experience mental health problems in, in everyday life and particularly interested in the way that physical and mental health interact together. Um, and so as a general practitioner, my interest was sparked in an understanding uh, in particular, how we might respond early to people experiencing mental health problems um, and really try to avoid those mental health problems going on and becoming um, something that might be chronic and ongoing over their lives. Um, and so that's really been the focus of my research, trying to uh, intervene, identify things early, intervene, and then try to make things better for people so that they can uh, live more happy and productive lives. Yeah, that's, 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 really, that's really cool. Um, and you, you mentioned the relationship, I guess there's a lot of relationships between um, mental health there, but you mentioned particularly mental health and um, chronic illness and also mental health and gender. Can you maybe just um, elaborate on that? Yeah, well, look, I think probably one of the most interesting um, things that uh, we've noticed is that there is a very strong link between poor physical health and poor mental health. And so by that, I, I don't mean just chronic illnesses like diabetes or hypertension. I just mean uh, not feeling healthy in yourself. So when we ask people a really simple question, just like how do you rate your health uh, in general, and we give people the option of saying whether they rate it as poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent, so a very, very simple question, we find that people that rate their general health more towards the end of poor or fair, that they also experience quite significant mental health symptoms, particularly of depression and anxiety. And they're probably the common mental disorders are the things that I've studied in most detail. Obviously, there's the other end of mental health condition. Obviously, depression and anxiety can be all the way from mild to very, very severe and disabling. Yeah. Uh, and then there's other mental illnesses like psychosis um, or more, you know, um, more serious conditions that are um, very, very destructive on, or can be destructive on people's lives, which mm. is the you know, chronic psychosis. And that's probably you know, the, the very severe end of mental illness. My work is focused on the whole spectrum of illness, but um, really looking at those symptoms that commonly present around depression and anxiety. Okay, so it sounds here like there's a, there's a spectrum going on and you really deal with the whole spectrum. Um, so I, I guess those people in the far end of the spectrum um, those would be very serious cases, but for the people who are experiencing, I guess, just anxiety and, and sort of fear um, during this whole COVID-19 situation, what are some, I guess, general tips that you could give to them um, mm -hmm. how to, on how to manage that? Yeah. Well, look, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last 15 years has really been gathering information from people that attend general practices. And we did a big study called the Diamond Study that followed people for 10 years. And so we do have a lot of insight into the sorts of things that, that you know, ordinary people do in their everyday life to try and keep them well. And I suppose COVID-19 highlights the need for those everyday practices. 
So the things that I would say is that we shouldn't underestimate the importance of um, everyday routines and things to keep us well. So things like, um, you know, keeping well and active. So going for daily walks, um, spending time in nature, um, learning meditation, taking up something you enjoy, whether that might be bike riding or yoga or Tai Chi or um, martial arts or um, whatever it might be, tennis, volleyball, um, some kind of activity. Now, we know that in COVID-19 days, we haven't um, been encouraged to do quite a number of those things um, but because they involve other people. But yeah. we know that um, social, social activity is also another thing, having someone to talk to, having someone to talk about how you really feel. These are all what I would call informal supports. These are all everyday practices that everyone can do. And I've been particularly interested throughout my career and as a general practitioner to look at um, trying not to medicalise those early feelings of anxiety and depression too early yeah. so that, that we aren't having people feel um, that they don't have some um, ability to make a difference. And that, I, I say, you know, that is a balance that we have to, to make because, of course, we also have um, a desire to get people into very effective uh, medical treatments and psychological treatments as early as possible. So you can see there, there's a, um, a little bit of a dilemma there. So I'm interested both in everyday practices and informal supports and things that people can do to keep themselves well but also wanting at the same time to identify people who, who that might not be working for and swiftly get them into, um, into things that really, uh, interventions and treatments and things that can really make a difference. Cool. Um, so thank you for the, the practical ways that we can sort of handle the situation. Also mm -hmm. insight into your, the, um, you mentioned a diamond cohort study. Yes. Um, so I guess one question here is, is then how can you determine um, how are you, what, what are you using to determine which people are at risk and which people are sort of, you don't want to medicalize mm. their, their mental health? Um, yeah, well, look, we use some really well-established measures that are survey self-report. Um, in One of them is called the Patient Health Questionnaire 9 or PHQ. And that asks about very common symptoms of depression. There's also um, scales that look at very common symptoms of anxiety. So there's sort of, you know, your, your um, traditional medical and psychological symptoms that you ask people about feeling down, depressed or hopeless, asking them about concentration and those sorts of, you know, more um, part of the mental health interview that doctors and psychologists do. Um, but we also include in the questions we ask things about how they, as I said, how they rate their general health, whether they have people to talk to and rely upon. And also, uh, maybe from your particular um, area of interest, we ask them about how they, whether or not they feel able to manage on their available income. Because we know that financial stressors are also very uh, key to um, you know, exacerbating um, mental health symptoms. So we ask a wide variety of questions. You might also be, we, we've developed a very simple tool to help um, GPs do their work more uh, efficiently by asking some of these simple questions. And we use a, a complicated algorithm behind that to sort to predict the likelihood that someone might have a problem uh, in the future. And that's been part of a study funded by the NH and MRC that we've just completed recently. And we, um, we know that if we can identify people early that might have ongoing problems, then we can work with them to get them into exactly the right form of care for them so that we try and tailor that, that treatment for them. So the, the questions uh, self-report though, I think one of the interesting things about mental health problems is that we don't have a particular diagnostic test. 
it's not like COVID-19 where you can have a, um, a nasal um, pharyngeal swab and things yeah. done and then they can find the virus and say, you, you know, you've got COVID-19. It's not like that. We don't have um, a definitive diagnostic test for mental health problems, which makes them much more tricky um, to both diagnose but also to um, study. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Um, that's that. Thank you for that. Um, but so with, with that, then I guess it, it will move towards more of your your research um, and your area with mental health and how um, I sort of read. I think through either the the Diamond Cohort Study, just a, b- a brief look somewhere there. But that GPs are the um, basically what patients come in to talk to GPs about the most is their mental health. Um, And now in this situation where we're all isolated and there's no, there's not much face-to-face interaction, uh, how are sort of GPs tackling that? You know, how well prepared are GPs for um, general practitioners um, for how how prepared are they um, in tackling the mental health issues that people are presenting right now, especially through, I guess the mobile apps and whatnot that are currently being used as an increase in that um, but power. Yeah. Are we- yeah. Look, GPs are at the front line of the healthcare system. So general practitioners in Australia also have gone through quite rigorous training for many, many years now, right back from the, the 1980s when um, all GPs are expected to be able to manage, identify and manage all the common mental health problems. And and that's because we recognised a very long time ago um, that mental health problems are very common in the community and that for most people, one of the first people that they told about their mental health problem was a general practitioner. And so our medical student training now and our general practice specialist training programs now or include a focus on, on mental health. Of course, we also have the specialist training programs for psychiatrists and for psychologists through clinical psychology where they only see mental health problems. But yeah. for GPs, we see a mix of physical health problems and mental health problems. And it's interesting that, um, you know, not every problem, mental health problem in, in general practice, but very many are. and as most people in your um, audience will will know that um, you know physical health problems and mental health problems often mixed up together so things like you know feeling feeling um, unwell feeling run down feeling tired and exhausted can be a physical health problem it can mean that you might have something like anemia for instance um, but it can also be one of the, the, the symptoms of a mental health problem, in particular depression. And so GPs were always um, sorting out this complex interplay between physical health problems and mental health problems. Yeah. And GPs are being... Um, so they can do a lot of the mental health care um, and they're also very good at identifying who to refer people to. Now, yeah. how prepared were we for um, the COVID-19? Of course, no one was really prepared, but... How swiftly have GPs been able to pivot and support their patient populations throughout this time? It's been remarkable. So very, very quickly, you know, turned to working out how they could use telephone calls, how they could use um, telehealth like videos that we're doing now, um, how they could still see people safely in the waiting room. Um, And so they've really instituted a whole host of things so that they can continue to be accessible to patients. Is it the same as it was before we had these issues of physical distancing, etc.? No, it's really radically changed the way that um, GPs are doing their routine everyday general practice. Uh, and I'm sure that there are both benefits but also um, weaknesses of those approaches. Because there's nothing like a consultation where you're having a discussion with someone. It's very private, it's very confidential. And they will tell you things that they've never told other people before. Mm. And so that's very powerful in itself. So it's a great privilege to be a general practitioner and to be a part of people's lives in that way. 
Um, it's one of the most rewarding parts of general practice, you know, from my point of view. Um, and then that being able to help people find the care that they need, trying to match them with the sorts of things that are going to help them. And then always being there, because general practice is the big safety net of our healthcare system too. Yep. So even when they might have gone off and seen specialists, mental health um, uh, specialists, they might have gone and done special programs. If that hasn't worked out, they come back to the GP to um, try and you know, work out what the next step might be. Mm. So, you know, GPs play that really important role. We also do use, you know, um, uh, recommend apps and, and online programs as, along with face-to-face -face ones. Um, and all of that is a part of what GPs do. Um, of course, there's less evidence um, for GPs to go on in terms of the best apps to recommend, etc., because mm. many of them haven't been tested rigorously in randomised trials in the same way as medications and psychological interventions have to be. So, you know, there is a real need there for more research on the best way for us to use online um, resources to help people or digital resources, if you like. Yeah, so those apps like if, if someone's like using Headspace or something to calm down. Um, so you, you guys don't have a recommendation for that, but uh, it's, it's really, I guess, to your own, your own choice. Yeah, no, we would have usually, yes, that's right. Usually um, we would have a, a list of things we commonly recommended, but there are some very good resources available on government websites and um, other websites that you can look at in terms of things that have had evidence, um, have had research done on them. And, and there are some very um, excellent resources that have been developed here in Australia and all sorts of, of online platforms that people can access. You know, things like Reach Out, MindSpot, um, many resources on uh, Black Dog at the UNSW, resources from our own um, department and schools here at the University of Melbourne. Um, we have the School of Psychological Sciences within the faculty. They're very active in developing up online um, supports and therapies for people with all sorts of mental health conditions. So there's a plethora of things available. And part of the tricky bit is choosing one um, that, that suits you. And, you know, I encourage people to take a look at the different resources that are available and um, see which one do they, uh, which one do they find they engage with. Yeah, definitely. So I guess it's really choosing what fits your needs. Yeah, exactly. And, and you mentioned um, the randomised control trials, I guess, with your you know, um, interactions, the face-to-face -face interactions. And so there's a lot of evidence base around the actual um, setting, the live interactions between a GP and a patient. How mm -hmm. has this sort of, and also your, your primary work is um, on collecting data, right? So unobtrusive data from all patients um, that go and see a GP. So how has this situation with COVID-19 um, affected that, I guess, data collection? Mm. Have there been measures put in place with the online, um, I guess, meetings with patients? Or? Yeah, look, it's been very challenging. As it happened for my own research projects, we happened to be just at a point in time where we just finished one. We'd been out into the field and we just finished all that data collection and we're just in the, the space of a year-long process of developing up the next one. And, and so that timing wise, we've been fortunate. And um, I know that not that, that hasn't been the case for all of the research team that I work with. There's one mm. of the projects we've, we've had to stop. We started recruitment and then we had to exit recruitment from the general practices. And we're hoping to go back soon. We're just starting to talk with them about how we might do that safely. Yeah. The reason we, we left it was really not to be in their way. You know, if things were going to get very, very busy in the healthcare system, as we were anticipating, if things um, weren't well controlled, we may have had all the you know, GPs and hospitals extraordinarily busy and we didn't want to be um, clogging up the waiting room, if you like, with um, um, our research assistants trying to recruit. We have um, also um, made sure that uh, when we go back into the general practices for recruitment, that we go back safely. 
um, the trial I'm working on at the moment is one which we're looking at how we help people to make sensible decisions about when they might um, reduce antidepressants. Yeah. And um, particularly looking at people that have been on long-term antidepressants. So that's, that's a, a current trial that we're just developing up at the moment. And it will be a mix of online support for the person um, along with um, input from a nurse who works closely with the GP to assist the person to make sensible decisions about um, whether or not they continue on antidepressants in the longer term. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's interesting that you're, you're doing that research. And I guess you're building off from the findings from the diamond cohort study. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so with the, I guess the, the, the topic for antidepressants and um, I guess more severe depression, we'll, we'll leave that for another day. Um, but to, to sort of end um, the interview and thank you again for your time. But um, to end the interview, then I guess what 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 do you see in the the future for you? Um, I guess in your in your work um, besides what you've already said, I guess. Yeah, well, at the moment during this whole pandemic, I've also taken on the role of being the chief public health advisor for the university. So yeah. that's been a very big role, working closely with the chancellery colleagues to. Um, think about all the things that we need to put in place to make the campus safe and and help us um, return activities to the campus. Yeah. And that, that's been a, a big um, focus of mine over the last two months. Um, and that will continue to be a part of my role going into the future. In and so juggling that with, with the research team has meant, of course, you know, research is all about teamwork and I have a wonderful team that um, are within the Department of General Practice in the medical school. Um, and they've been the, the really, you know, they're the, the engine room behind um, all of the research and, and that will keep going. So one of the things, of course, is just um, making sure that all the information, all, all the learning that we have from the work that we've done over the last 15 years, what, how can we best put that to use now yep. in terms of preparing the sorts of studies that might be needed for um, the looking after people's health after the pandemic. Also thinking about how the sorts of interventions and things that we have developed um, and the things that we have been working on, how do we actually now adapt them to this new environment where, um, like we were working a lot around digital um, and human-computer interaction digitally supported interventions before COVID-19. And I think what's happened with this pandemic is it's given us an extra boost of enthusiasm to really push ahead with that because we really need those things. Um, simple things like changes to the way telehealth is being used within general practice, um, you know, actually is quite supportive of the sorts of research directions we were heading in. And so that's facilitated and should make um, uh, it should make it easier for some of our research to happen, although it'll make it harder for <laughs> other research to happen that need a yeah. face-to-face component. So, um, you know, there's benefits and, and losses. I, I think one of the most important things is that we all, um, throughout this, the importance of a trusted um, person that you can confide in and I would say um, trying to highlight the importance of everyone having a GP that they trust, mm. particularly when they're feeling some mental health symptoms like depression or anxiety. And so taking that time to form the relationship with the GP is the hardest thing if you can't go and see them in person. Um, and, and so I, I hope that, you know, um, there'll be very, very safe ways to make people feel comfortable about going back to the GP. I, I know our university health services continue to provide both face-to-face -face care and telehealth all the way throughout um, the last few months. And they've been a great support to many um, of your colleagues, I'm sure, and my colleagues as well. Yep. Um, and so I think, you know, working with them also to in the future to that, that, um, look at how we can... Um, you know, make those models of care ones that look after people. 
So that'll be keeping me busy, um, yep. as well as all the, you know, potentially new research projects. Mm. Cool. Well, it sounds like you have a lot to do. Um, and yes. <laughs> In the future. Um, anyway, so thank you, Professor Jane Gunn. It's been wonderful to hear your expert opinion on how COVID-19 has affected the delivery of, of primary care and also the mental health services, um, and also about your area of work in primary care reform and the uh, importance of data collection, which is, I think, very important. Um, so thank you for your time and all the work that you've done in the field so far. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks so much, and, and good luck to everyone with the rest of the year ahead. Wishing you all the best. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.